Okay. So thanks everyone. I'm Jim Richards. Most of you know me. I think to some extent I'm preaching to my choir. A uh, few new guys, whatever. So what I wanted to do is give you a briefing. Uh, progress last year at Aerodyme and so forth, kind of where we stand with the various conversion fleet numbers and so forth and what's new. And then maybe we talk a little bit about the 580 in particular. So uh, let's start there with those numbers. This one we just completed last week for David Morrison out of Utah. This was and will remain a 114 TC, but it is now a normally aspirated turbocharged airplane. So, uh, no, I mean, they did, when we change them to normally aspirated, the FAA doesn't want to, to, to make it a 114. It remains a 114 TC as far as they're concerned. So anyway, this is the fourth 114 TC that we've converted to 580. Uh, and that math is very simple. If you're not operating above 15,000 feet all the time, this is the better solution. And very few 114 TC owners fly up there enough to make it worthwhile. So, so that's why someone would think about this. So this is number 20. Uh, the more, even more interesting thing is that number 21 starts build in Venezuela uh, in about a month. And then numbers 22 and 23 start build at Guernsey in the Channel Islands, UK, uh, in November. So by the time the year is out, there might have been five added to the fleet this year. And that is just, in my mind, record breaking. And that's, 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 uh, that's amazing. So uh, we're, we're real pleased with how that's going. Uh, the little brother conversion, the 390 Super Commander, there's at least one here, Bill Hopkins is here with his 390 Super. Uh, that fleet still stands at three. Uh, they're doing well. I think all of you know Bill's been very pleased with his conversion. Uh, what that one does, we'll talk, we could talk a little bit more about if uh, anyone was interested in particular, but that converts the 112, adds some horsepower, adds some speed. And that fleet is at three as of now. The IO540 Slick Commander, that's the program where we uh, can take a 114 or 114A, currently wearing the IO540 T4A5D or T4B5D engine, meaning you have a dual magneto. That's what the D stands for at the end. Uh, we can take that engine off your airplane when it's run out or timed out or ready to go have you send it to Lycoming as a core and get back from Lycoming what I'd call the commander engine. In other words, the T4B5. Uh, more or less the same engine, but with a pair of slick magnetos on the back of it. So that's the 114B engine. We call that the slick commander. That fleet stands at six at the moment. So that's been a pretty popular program. Uh, and. Uh, there is a bit of extra expense involved in that, but it's not bad. Uh, we were just working some numbers out uh, for an inquiry here the last couple of days, and it looked like under 50K done, including the engine, the unlike core charge, the charge for my STC, and the installation, probably comfortably under 50, all done flying. So that fleet stands at six. Uh, the Hartzell three-blade prop, about a year ago I got the approval, maybe it's a year and a half, for, the, for this prop, the same one we've always used with the 580 Supers, to be put on any 114 or 114A. Uh, and that program now stands at nine. Uh, that's been pretty popular. We can do that in two blade lengths. This is the 78-inch blade we've always used with the 580. But when, it, when you do it as the STC prop only, uh, it can be either 77 or 78. I recommend 78 unless you're doing a lot of grass strip or dirt strip operation and you really don't want that extra inch because the thrust characteristics are excellent with this propeller. So, so that program is now at nine. That's been pretty popular. That's basically all happened in more or less one year. So that, that's, those are good numbers. Uh, the Superstream Commander, and this is not one, but out on the line there are probably a half dozen Superstream commanders here today. Superstream is where we take uh, uh, the horizontal stabilizer and change its angle of incidence. And the reason we do that is to streamline the horizontal surfaces for cruising flight. 
so that the plane will no longer fly with down elevator when you're in cruise. The elevators will come level and therefore the trim tabs can fly in stream behind the elevators. It kind of packs it all right in streamline like you'd think it should be and really should be. That's been very popular. Uh, that can be done as a kit by any shop with some support from us or it can be done by us and I'd say we've done 20 in Vermont at my shop. The balance have been done all over the world. Uh, we did five. We went over and helped to do five uh, at Guernsey last winter in the UK. There are, I think, three in Australia. So, you know, we're, we're getting out there. That program stands at 32, and the 33rd will start build at my shop next week. So that's been very popular. Uh, I think fairly universally happy campers. Uh, and again, we can talk more about that program if there are particular questions. But I would say one more thing before moving on, and that is that the remedial value of that operation is worth it. If you're at 2,000 hours or above on the airframe, I think that the process of disassembling the tail in the entirety, having a good look at it, seeing anything and everything that might be going on, and taking care of those things at the same time as it's being streamlined. Uh, I'd say of the 20 I've done, in half of those cases, at least 10 of those airplanes, let's say, uh, we found stuff that I'm glad we found that wasn't going to bring the plane out of the air anytime soon or anything like that, but was going to progress and become more and more expensive to repair at some point. And on two or three of those airplanes, they should not have been flying. They should not have flown to my shop for the conversion. So we're able to correct all of that stuff uh, because we have worked out over 32 airplanes now all of these various FAA approvals. I have about a dozen FAA approvals for oversized holes, worn out here, a uh, little crack there, you know, it's, it's all patterned out. So that program is 32 going on 33. Uh, usually we're either shipping a kit or getting another airplane to do uh, about every month on that program. Uh, okay, now empennage control surfaces. So you remember back a few years ago, uh, we picked up our first AD on the fleet since the 70s. And, or since the 80s, and that was the elevator spars. I know many of you are already my customers for elevator spars. Thank you very much. 197 uh, Aerodyne PMA FAA approved elevator spars have been installed into the fleet. Uh, but at the same time, as we addressed the elevator spars uh, a couple of years ago, we also wanted to cure what was going on. So we went way deeper set up test stands, loaded elevators, looked at deflections, tried to figure out what's up with this. Uh, we were going back to a place that, that uh, Rock, Rockwell Gulfstream had been back in 1977, uh, when they first knew there was a little bit of stuff going on back there. Uh, when Rockwell uh, ceased operations, uh, a bunch of stuff just kind of did a freeze frame. You know, if a service bulletin was kind of half written or whatever, you know. So many things didn't propagate into the fleet. And that's really what happened in our tail feathers, is some stuff that was known about just about the time they were wrapping up and shutting down just never got the push. It wasn't a drummer. You know, let's get this done. So anyway, uh, we looked at it, uh, and with FAA uh, watchful and careful oversight, uh, came up with what we call the inoculation kits. Uh, most of you are pretty familiar with, but I'd be glad to explain, uh, you know, individually, anyone who'd like to know more. But we basically fix that outboard elevator hinge position so that the loads are transmitted differently from the elevator, which is the weak part in that sense, to the strong part, which is the stabilator. I could get up, as some of you know, I could get a stepladder, get up on that tail, and I could walk out on that horizontal stab I weigh maybe 160 these days. I could walk out there and probably not do it any harm if I was a little careful with where I was stepping. I, I couldn't walk out on the elevator. That's the weaker part in certain senses. And unfortunately, it was taking a big part of the load. So we had to, we had to let the elevator get rid of that and react to that load differently. And it took a different hinge design to do that. In effect, very interesting because it was a microcosm of what had gone on here at the gear fitting, the main gear brace fitting with one of the main ADs. In my mind, same mistake, same design uh, mistake or 
technique, whatever you want to call it, uh, same design approach had really led to the gear brace fitting uh, AD. So anyway, uh, 243 elevators have been now inoculated. Uh, and I do keep bugging the, uh, the FAA about uh, accepting this as a terminating action, except that realistically, I don't believe that, uh, or I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced I will ever achieve terminating action. I would be very pleased to achieve simple visual inspection. Once the Aerodyme inoculation kits are installed, the bulk of the load is reacted in three new rivets that you can easily view from standing just below or looking just above from the exterior without a bore scope. You can see them, they're right there. If anything has begun to happen in that hinge, it will show up in those rivets. So I've, I've, I'm trying to work the FAA toward that agreement that, uh, that in a careful, visual, clean inspection, et cetera, of those rivets would suffice. Uh, really, nothing more than your IA should be doing every year on every control surface hinge, but agreeing with the FAA that let's call their eyes to it. You know, let's say, hey, do the, if you're not going to do them all, do this one. So we're working on that all along the way. Meantime, you do still have to stick a bore scope in there each year and have a look, make sure nothing's, nothing bad's happening. Uh, now, the rudders, I talked yesterday morning about the rudders a little bit. Uh, when, when Rockwell addressed the empennage in 77, they were actually worried about the top hinge of the rudder. That was the focus of the first service letter relating to elevators and rudder. Uh, and they were worried about a similar thing to what eventually began to go wrong in our elevators, but they were focused on the top of the rudder. Again, same design technique had led to trouble there. Uh, so uh, that's kind of come back to roost because they, in that service kit, did define a fix. A set of doublers, some plates that would go into the rudder and would change that load path and would uh, protect those rudders. That service bulletin went, or service letter went nowhere. You know, I'll, I'll bet that 5% of the fleet got that letter accomplished back in, uh, in, well, at any time since then. So a lot of rudders have cracked at that top attach. Uh, we've done a full kit. Uh, I have diagrams of it here. Uh, we've rebuilt uh, 15 rudders at Aerodyme, and I've sent out a number of uh, kits. Probably I've sent it out in kit form now half a dozen times uh, to rebuild the rudders. Uh, we all know uh, from flying them that maybe in the airworthiness department, that may be where our commanders are uh, a little under endowed, you know, rudder authority. Uh, maybe we would have liked 20% more or something. Uh, and so our rudders take a fair load, you know, when we're trying to use that rudder, which is maybe a little less than it should be, to get the, author to get the control force we need for the crosswind landing or whatever we're doing. Uh, so there are a few things going on. We've addressed all of them. When a rudder comes to me, we do it all. Right down. It goes out as really a different structure. Uh, I gave, showed a video of it the other morning. I could replay it uh, if anyone wanted to see it. Uh, at the next stage down is the fin rib, which again Rockwell was aware of having a few issues. So in the lower vertical fin, if I take this tail apart, I take the top half of the fin off, off, put it over here, uh, unbolt the horizontal stabilizer, even with the elevators attached. When I do it at my shop, I lift it up onto a platform directly up here above the plane to get it out of my way. What that would leave is the stub fin, or leave the lower fin. And right at the top of that fin is a rib, and uh, a rib and some fashion of doubler. So again, that dates back to a service bulletin uh, from late 70s, I think that's maybe a 77 date. Uh, they knew something was going on, they needed to strengthen that. That rib originally was a 20 thousandths rib, and that wasn't even close to what they needed. So then it became uh, 30, 32 thou, then it became 40, then it became doubled. There were, I, I did a chronology one day, I'd send you the spreadsheet if you want to be, <laughs> whatever. I don't know why I even did it, but I just got into it one evening. I think it's seven design iterations from the 112 all the way through the 114B. Seven times it was readdressed. The last time it was addressed was the B kit, so the 
SB 11412B kit, and there's a there's a there's an analog for the I mean the 114s, and there's a similar kit for the 112s. So it was a 40 thousandths rib, it was a 40 thousandths doubler, and the doubler was about 80 percent. It doubled about 80 percent of the rib. So we did that kit. Every time we do a kit, and we've had this one available maybe three years. Every time we do a kit, my, my job is not only to try and come up with the parts because they aren't available anymore to accomplish the bulletin, so you have to be able to get the parts somewhere. But my job, I also accept as a part of the challenge, is to come up with a kit that can be successfully installed. Now the commander kit for that, or the, the CAC kit, uh, had the rib and the doubler already riveted together. Many of you have probably seen that kit maybe when it went into your airplanes. Very strong structure with that rib and that doubler already riveted together in the entirety. It's got a full sandwich with opposing flanges. I could put that thing across two of my plastic tubs there or whatever, and I could probably jump up and down on it and not deform it. Now try and install that into the fin of an existing airplane. It doesn't deform, the fin does, right? So fins come, came out of that process with skins waving back and forth trying to pull themselves in to this rib uh, doubler structure which wouldn't comply. So we said, no, no, this is not going to work. So we set the kit up, the Aerodyne kit, to allow for spacer strips longitudinally that could be of the appropriate thickness and could even be uh, uh, laminated in a sense. You might need a 50 thou spacer up front but then you might need to gain 20 thou by the time you're at the back, so you'd overlap. Uh, and then a spacer in the rear, so that the installation could comply with the airplane. So we've done uh, 20 of those uh, kits. Most of those we've done at Aerodyne, but we've probably sent that kit out to outside shops three or four times. Uh, okay, uh, last year, we had for the first time to condemn an elevator horn weldment. There's this critical steel kingpin part in the, in the tail of your commander. It connects the one elevator to the other, and it connects the controls to that central part. You could call it the center fitting. The elevator horn weldment is its official name. Uh, it's a steel part, and you know what that means, right? Steel rusts. Uh, aluminum doesn't, right? So, uh, so some of these have been under attack for a long time. Coastal airplanes, this sort of thing. Bad paint, let go too long, whatever. So last year we encountered our first perforated elevator horn weldman, and it was kind of scary. Uh, it's Western Canada. Uh, they sent me pictures. I said, gee, that looks pretty bad. They thought it looked a little spotty during annual, saw a couple of pits or something and said, we better take this over the blast cabinet and blast it. And when they did, it just went perforated, right? The thing had maybe 30 perforations. Uh, what happens is water sits in the bottom of it. There's no outlet. So anyway, uh, we've now built and have FAA approval on brand new from scratch elevator horn weldments. Uh, that was a full on uh, deal. The fixturing for those is uh, it is, was a significant undertaking. Uh, we've only installed one of those so far. We've only needed one for that particular airplane so far. I think most of your planes are probably in pretty good shape in that department. We have also developed a lesser process by which if maybe your weldment is thinking about a little bit of trouble internal, uh, we can open up. There's there are currently only quarter inch holes in each end. And a, an eight inch long bolt that goes through it. Uh, and it was impossible in that fashion as manufactured to get in there to clean it, to say prepare it, reprime it, whatever. You couldn't get in there, two quarter inch holes. So what we've done is gotten FAA approval to bore one or both of those holes up to three quarters of an inch, which allows me to get in there with scrubbing brushes and so forth, clean it all out, treat it, reprime it, get it back to where it needs to be. Uh, and then bushings go back into those larger holes. So, so that process is available, and uh, so now we can, we've, I think we've probably done that three or four times now, and we can recommend it whenever we think it would be, it would be appropriate. Uh, steering shimmy dampers is next. Uh, thank you for the patience of all of you, many here today, 
who gave me deposits on shimmy dampers maybe as much as a year and a half ago. We made 10 of these available for a beta program. Five of them are already in the field. This one's spoken for, that leaves four left. But to come in now, I have to get $1,250. And so there's no pressure on any of you because that's not the deal that, we, that I had offered. So for that, I need just more time to, to get it done. Uh, okay, so that's the new damper, uh, finally in existence. Uh, okay, service kits. So most of you know that we've been doing service kits for various relatively standard maintenance parts of the airplane for ever since, I don't know, 2007 or something. So as of this year, we're up to 51 kits, uh, getting some pretty good coverage on the stuff that usually needs attention. Uh, when you buy a kit from me, it might cost 50 bucks to buy what seems like a bag of O-rings or something. But, but realize that what's coming along in that package is not only those O-rings, and by the way, knowing where to get them, and knowing where to get approved O-rings, and knowing where to get approved O-rings that aren't from 1970. So, you know, there's kind of that stuff. So they're actually good, fresh parts to start with. Uh, but also, almost always in the kits, there'll be some things in there that I know you're gonna need, really likely you're gonna need. It might only be a 16 thou shim washer because I know you're gonna need it. How many standard shops have a 16 thou shim washer in their cabinet? Okay, you just wiped out 75% of aviation shops. But I've got them in my cabinet, so I have put one in there for you. Uh, also, there'll be some instructions. In some of the kits, they're pretty good and pretty, uh, you know, expanded instructions and the other kits uh, you might need to call me but we you, there, there's there'll be some help and if if the kit doesn't come with all the instruction your mechanic needs the technical support is free and unlimited so they can call me up and I get a lot of calls and, and it's not a problem so we try to walk them through it well here's your objective here's what you're trying to achieve oh okay right now I get it so 51 kits and we really appreciate all the business really uh, <laughs> I mean, that kit business, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kits, and all that running around, uh, you know, wouldn't even hold a candle to the profit margin I have on doing 1580. So we could say, oh, this is just too much of a nuisance. <laughs> Good grief. But no, we, we enjoy doing them. Uh, I, I really enjoy being able to provide what we think is a good solution for a lot of the regular maintenance items. And some days are more hectic for Martine than others, but we try and get all the, the, the kit orders filled every day and get them out. So sorry if there have been exceptions to that. I know there have. Sid. On the dampers, uh, in the engineering design changes that you made, yeah. have you retained the little nylon spheres? Or have you One of them is, is still used. Yeah, and I can come back later if, if for follow-up question. Uh, new product lines, okay, control cables. Call after call after call. Do you have rudder cables? Do you have throttle cable? Call after call after call. So, so okay, here's a start. New product line, airframe control cables. I now have forward rudder cables. FAA approved forward rudder cables. So those are the ones that run from the pedals back to about the mid tail where the turnbuckles are located. We've got those. 530 seconds, so they are the stronger later model cables which can be retrofitted into any of the frames. The other one I already have, uh, just, we just finished up a couple months ago, is the, a little bit tricky, it's the pitch trim forward cable. It's the cable that comes from mid tail, comes up to the drum that you roll for pitch control, has a little, a little kind of a, a a, a pin swaged onto it which keys it into the drum and then it runs back again. So swaging that little pin on there makes that one something that stumps McFarlane. McFarlane said, what's that? I said, well can you duplicate it? Well, we don't know what it is, right? Uh, so anyway, work that out. We now have those pitch trim forward cables available. Uh, steering cables we've been able to do for a while because there's a lot of trouble with the cable that runs from the bungee forward to the pulleys and then it through the pulley and attaches to the trunnion uh, because the exit of that cable at the end of the bungee is steel on steel. There's no sort of protection. That steel on steel 
Uh, and so those fray right there where they're coming out of the bungee. And I've seen some really bad cases, so it's good to always look there every year. You know, and don't put your fingers down there and check it that way. I mean, take a look with your eyeballs or you're going you're gonna to hurt yourself if you pick up a couple strands half inch into your finger. So, uh, but look there every year, clean them up, take the grease off and look because a lot of them are just worn to the point now where they're fraying badly. So we can do those, but we do them at Aerodyme. So you can take your bungees off, cable included, send it to me, tear the bungee down, give it any help it needs, uh, install a new cable onto it and send it back. So we've been able to do that one a while. Uh, new initiatives, sort of coming attractions, what might come next? Uh, what's going to have to come next is some work on gear actuators. Because gear actuators are just more and more of a nuisance the further we go. Uh, there are two particular nuisances which come, have to come first. I talked about one yesterday morning, which is the uh, nose gear actuator in particular, uh, used on 112s, serial 1 through 380, with the locking pin mechanisms. So, since Sven, uh, Sven's parts that he and Frank had done years ago uh, were gone years ago, they were, they were scoffed up and put on airplanes, there, those parts haven't been available. The pin and the collar, the two parts, the two halves of the lock haven't been available. They are now again, so we have those available again, FAA approved, made to the proper specs. The next part of that uh, will be the aft cap for the B model or TC model, so the actuator on this plane, the aft cap uh, is improperly machined. That actuator is supposed to be the same that Rockwell was using at the end of the 70s. And it looks the same from the outside. When you take it apart, guess what? It isn't the same. When Gar Kenyon took over the manufacturing, they kind of fouled up the machining of the O-ring grooves in that cap. And so some of the B model owners and 114 TC model owners are just having horrible problems. You know, it's like every flight they're expecting to land and see hydraulic fluid all over the ramp. So we have to do a new aft cap for that actuator. We'll do it sometime this winter. That'll be pretty simple uh, compared to the challenge of doing the shimmy damper full on. So, uh, no, Gar Canyon's very hard to deal with. Uh, you call up and talk to Marie for a few minutes and you'll just walk away. You know? Very hard to do. They won't sell parts. No parts whatsoever. If you send them your actuator for assessment and potential repair, almost invariable, they'll call you, invariably they'll call you back and tell you they don't have those parts. They'll need to sell you a new one. The new one will cost 1900 bucks, I think, at the moment. Uh, uh, so anyway. We'll step into gear actuators. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, so let's go back to 580 for a few minutes if I've got any time left. Uh, so I put down a little thing here, uh, 580 Super Commander flight records. So, and our stuff is actual. This isn't what we think it could do. Uh, I only have numbers here that the Super Commanders have done. Not all Super Commanders can do all these numbers, but at least one Super Commander has done each and every one of these numbers. Uh, Sea level rate of climb standard conditions at gross 3,000 feet a minute. That was my own 5LP during the original test flights off Burlington, Vermont, which I lie is actually 320 MSL. So, so fudge me, allow me the fudge there. But sea level uh, with a lighter ship like 5LP, uh, let's see, she 1,900 empty, I think. Uh, 3,000 feet a minute. And by the way, one of the reason that performance numbers vary a lot across all of our commanders, whatever the engine, is that our empty weights vary over an amazing spread, right? The empty weight of the same airplane can vary all the way from, let's say, 1,800 pounds at a low to 2,500, maybe 2,550. That's amazing to have a one airplane design be able to vary that much empty, right? So anyway, that changes the numbers ship to ship uh, a fair amount. Uh, 580 Super Commander sea level to 12,000 feet in 12 minutes. Uh, and that for me in Vermont, uh, where I deal with that winter forecast that lasts six months. I know Jeff has the same forecast in Michigan, which is icing and 30% uh, probability icing uh, clouds and precip, 3,000 to 9,000, whatever, just that's it. You know, we have six months of that forecast. It's a probability forecast. It's legal for me to try it. 
and it's not a problem to blast through it because the 580s are just so definite in the climb that even though I've probably started to frost by the time I blow out of 9,000 feet, it's done. And Oh, well, that took three, four minutes, you know, so, so it's, it's not a problem. I don't go out and try to do crazy things with the super commanders, but that rate of climb can be very, very useful. Uh, Robert Harris, who had me do a 580 for him two years ago, operates out of uh, Long, yeah, but in Colorado. Oh. Lo Long, Mon no, that's Texas. The Colorado end is 6,000 uh, 6, elevation airport and then he has to get over 14,000, I think, and he was just, you know, and, and the weather would be iffy, and he's, I'm done, so he's just fantastically happy. You just get in the plane and what? So uh, climbing, they're, they're just amazing ships. Uh, demonstrated service ceiling, 22,005 density altitude, uh, 100 foot a minute climb left. Uh, cruising, the best number so far, has come in actually from one of the heavier ships. This is uh, documented by air data, pictures, the whole thing. I, I don't find anything wrong with the way the data was taken and reported. Is a solid 180 knots cruise, a true, true airspeed in cruise, level at 10,000 feet. Uh, temperature was about uh, uh, ISA plus 5C, so it was about 10 Fahrenheit warmer than a standard day. Relatively smooth air, so that's good. That, that's the top end of what we see from the super commanders. The bottom end is down around 165. As the ship gets heavier, it might have TKS, might have air, might have a big oxygen bottle, might be really plush. Uh, so there's quite a range. Uh, demonstrated and projected. We, we can't actually demonstrate a range because we're not going to run the plane out of fuel to find out how far it could have gone. But we've got a great example here. This was a nonstop from Burlington to Savannah. I was flown on about the fifth Super Commander just before it was ferried across the Atlantic. So you have some idea why the flight was being made. Uh, see, OK, what can it do? Uh, and so 80% demonstrated, 20% projected based on fuel remaining, right? Uh, would have put the range at 989 miles. Not bad. Uh, same flight, endurance, w w projected, again, 80% of it flown, demonstrated, 20% projected based on fuel remaining 7.7 .7 hours. Not bad. How did they do that? And look at the economy. Very nearly, I think it's 13.8 nautical miles per gallon. Well, how can you do that? <laughs> it's a big engine, right? It should want a lot of fuel. This would be what one would expect. Well, actually, the flow will come down on a reasonably well-balanced, uh, uh, usually on the later models with the longer cowling, the cooling dynamics work a little better. Those will generally be a tighter cluster on CHTs, 50 or 60, without GAMI. Uh, those ships will usually give us the very best economy. Uh, down to 10.6, and maybe on the high side, most of them will at least be happy at 11.2. So and that would be the less organized airflow ships. Uh, and so the flow, and that's all rich at peak. Oh, sorry, I said that. But it's, all, it's actually all at peak. It's at the place Lycoming recommends fly the engines. Lean, 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 lean. Up oh, first to peak, stop there. Don't rich back up. That was the old technique. Don't do that. Stop there. That cylinder will be at 1,500 plus or minus 10, something like that, which is the comfortable place for me on EGTs. Uh, that's where that'll be. It'll probably be number two, which is eclipsed by the prop governor, so it runs a little hotter. Uh, and she'll be at, uh, oh, and then the RPM. The RPM is the trick. So with the, with the wonderful blade, the high thrust off the prop, this is an 800 pound thrust prop, uh, you can dial back the RPM to at least 2200. And if, if, you be, if you're concerned that, well, there's a bar or, you know, a a band on my indicator that seems to mean I shouldn't go lower than 2200. I've talked that over with Lycoming, and nobody knows why you shouldn't go lower than 2200. Uh, what you shouldn't do is fly greatly over square. So I shouldn't be dialed back to say 2000 RPM at 1500 feet in the traffic pattern because I may have 28 inches or 30 inches of manifold pressure and I'm running the engine substantially over square. I'm lugging it down and the engine will talk to you. Oh, 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 you know, it'll tell you, I'm lugging down here. So, uh, 
Anyway, if I'm at 12,000 feet, I have 19 inches of manifold pressure, right? So I can pull the prop back to 2,000. Well, the fuel consumption just goes, <sighs> it just, you know, it's like your mixture control is wired. You know, it's just, woo. So that's where these numbers are coming from. The true airspeed, to get those economy numbers, the true airspeed has come down from 170 to 180 range. It's come down to 145 to 150 range, right? But you're going the distance. And the fact that you've been able to so use your performance to climb quickly to your cruising altitude that you've planned. That operation, sea level to 12 in 12 minutes, uh, is probably an average flow of 22 gallons an hour, right? Because you're not going to starve it of fuel if you want to just pop up to cruise. So I'm going to probably flow 22. But once I'm out of 6,000, if I don't lean that sum, and I forget for a minute, maybe I arrive at 6, and then I think, oh, I haven't started to lean yet, and I lean it out, maybe pull it back to 18 gallons an hour passing through six. She picks me up in the butt and shoves me up through the air and reminds me that, oh yeah, I was flooded. You know, I was badly flooded. I'm glad you remembered and leaned me. And then by the time I arrive at 12, it's, it's pretty much at 15 gallons an hour, something like that. So I've only used six gallons to get there. Well, if I've got a 68-gallon ship, I have 62 gallons left, right? So now if I wanted to go the endurance or the range, if that was my objective for that flight, this is where these numbers come from. So you can do pretty amazing things uh, with, with the package. Uh, and, you know, you're not usually going to be blasting around at sea level at VNE eating uh, 32 gallons an hour. Uh, intercontinental flights of our products, we have two Atlantic crossings uh, by air. One in a box, uh, and there'll be one in a box this fall going to Australia. Uh, so I want to thank you all very much for your business uh, in all these forms. Uh, we're trying to keep it going, keep it strong, do, uh, do what we can to support the fleet. Uh, customer base is now probably a pretty high percentage of the flying commanders, uh, either from a kit or all the way up to a 580. Uh, we're probably... Uh, helping in some fashion 70, 75% of the owners at this point, more and more every, every year. You know, some of the word has taken a while to get to some of the far-flung places. So, uh, so anyway, that was my in intent here this morning, and if I have any time left, I'd be glad to take uh, questions. Thank you. Where'd Pat go? Or Carl, do you know? Am I, am I out of time? No, I don't have my Okay. Uh, Okay. No, this three blade, no, is a different prop from the, the one, the STC that's been available for the 112s. Yeah. That's a Hartzell STC, uh, been in existence for years. Uh, but this is, this is a larger diameter and a different blade design and so forth, yeah. Sid? Those uh, range and endurance numbers would probably match up with 145 true, 145 knots true. I think it was 146 for that actual flight, average over the cruising phase. 145 and could be getting around 11 gallons an hour. Yeah, yeah, 10.6. Yeah, because these numbers both came from a particular flight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're not unusual numbers, but they came from a particular flight. So I happen to remember what that true was. Other questions? Well, thank you very much.